Masechet Yoma, Daf 77. We're going to start today with a uh, long agada, and uh, then we're going to go back to, back into halacha. The halachot that we're dealing with um, are regarding the five different enuyim and trying to bring a source for each one of them. So the one that we're up to is rechisa, washing. How do we know that washing is not permitted? How do you know that it's called enuy? Uh, we brought some different uh, um, sources. And the one we landed on was from Daniel. Uh, it says for three weeks, uh, he's in mourning for three weeks. Uh, if you look in the context there, he sees that Persia is going to go through uh, 21 different kings that they're going to be um, ruling over Israel. And so he's mourning over that for three weeks. And while he's mourning, it says, Soch lo sachti, and we learn from there, Soch is, is uh, rinsing and Sachti um, is referring to anointing. And so that's where we learn it from. Okay, now that we mentioned uh, Pasuk and Daniel, we're going to go into some agada uh, that uh, occurs in that same chapter. So we ask, Daniel is uh, famously difficult to understand. He has a vision of an angel. The pedic before he's uh, praying, he's asking, uh, please uh, tell me, when is the final geulah going to happen? He's still under Persian rule. And he's like, when is this going to end? And finally, the angel Gabriel comes and tells him. And in, in this pedic, chapter 10 of Daniel, it says that Daniel says, I was able to come because of your words. Okay, now the following agada is a bit complex. So because it combines Pesukim from Daniel and from Yechezkel, what they have in common is that uh, they're seeing uh, different visions of angels. They're also talking about the same time period that they're under foreign rule and they're wondering, right, they're, or exile, and they're wondering when the thing's going to get better. So what the Midrash is going to do is going to mix and match, bring together many Pesukim. This is a Midrashic style, uh, harmonizing, seeing the whole Tanakh as one, and therefore related themes in different places can be brought together. So it's going to piece together uh, um, Pesukim. When you see the conversations uh, uh, coming up, uh, a lot of them are not actually in the Pesukim, but rather are based on a, a conglomeration of many Pesukim. So before we do that, because it's a little hard to follow, let me just tell you what the, the basic plot line of the story we're about to see um, is that the, uh, the, the um, Hashem is very angry. Hashem sees the terrible idolatry and sinning of the of Bnei Israel and the Bet Mikdash, and He says that's it. They deserve destruction. And the angels come, Michael, who's the guardian angel of Israel, and Gabriel. They said, "No, have mercy, right? Don't destroy them." And in the end, Hashem says, "I'm going to, no, I'm going to destroy them anyway." Gabriel, um, Hashem tells Gabriel to take coals and throw it down. That means destroying the Bet Mikdash, and he doesn't do it right away. Right? He holds on to the coals and delays it and thereby is able to save at least a remnant of Bnei Israel. And so this whole time Hashem is angry and then the angels are pushing back and they say, by what merit? And finally, Gabriel is going to say, by the merit of Daniel, he's beloved by God. And so, you know, for his, and his, for his sake, um, I want to plead for on behalf of Bnei Israel. So that's what this pasuk here means. Ani the angel Gabriel says, Daniel, I was able to come and enter uh, into God's throne and plead on your behalf, on Bnei Israel's behalf, because of you, Daniel, because you are so beloved and you are so righteous. Okay, that's going to be the answer, but we're going to take a while till we get there. So let's see how, uh, let's see the Pesukim inside now. Uh, hold on, let me pause here. So these are Pesukim from Yechezkel, chapter 8. Uh, two different Pesukim, actually, out of order. And the first one mentions 70 elders. And um, one of them, uh, 70, it reminds you, reminds you of the other 70 elders in the Torah. One of them, there, his name is Ya'azanyahu ben Shafan. Now, Shafan is someone we know. That's the famous scribe who found the Sefer Torah. And his grandson, Gedaliah ben Shafan, is the famous Gedaliah. And so this is a person, another someone, ben Shafan. This is really fascinating because archaeologists recently found a stamp, right, a seal, uh, that belonged to Gemariahu ben Shafan. So, and it's from the same time period. This is probably Shafan's son or grandson, and maybe the brother of 
the person mentioned by Yechezkel. So it's really amazing to actually find uh, a close relative of Shafan and uh, Gedaliah. Okay, anyway, he's among these 70 elders and they are holding ketoret. They're making ketoret to, to idolatry. This is what Yechezkel sees is going on um, towards the end of the Bet HaMikdash and why they're deserving of sin. And then it goes on and talks about more uh, other things that they do uh, later in the Perek. Um, he saw 25 people that are standing between the Mizbeach and the Hechal, and instead of facing the Hechal, which, be, which would be west, facing the Kotam Aravi, they're facing east towards the sun. Um, and that's exactly the opposite, right? The whole reason the Bet HaMikdash is facing west is not to face the sun. I mean, nowadays we're facing east, so we happen to face the sun because we live uh, um, on, on this side. But uh, they are in the Bet HaMikdash with their backs towards God, the back towards Hechal, and uh, worshiping idolatry. So terrible thing. Um, now we interrupt the Pesukim to explain this, the double language, that if they're facing east, isn't that obvious that their back is towards the Hechal. It's even further, of course, yes, their backs means their backs, they would uncover their backsides and defecate, uh, says Mata, downward, euphemism, that they would be doing that towards the Hechal. Now, not, not only were they worshiping idolatry, they were desecrating in a horrible way the Bet HaMikdash. So after that, Amanu HaKadosh Baruch Hu L'Michael, Michael, Sarcha Umatecha, right, Michael, he's the guardian angel of Israel, says, your nation has sinned. Amanu HaFanav, Rebono Sheolam, Dayol HaTobim Shebahen, as Michael says, okay, there's, there's some, a few righteous people, so save them on behalf of the righteous people. Okay, this conversation is not found in the Tanakh, but obviously it's based on uh, Abraham, Moshe, God says, I don't accept it. I'm going to burn them, good and bad, all together. Back to Yechazkel, before it was Yechazkel chapter 8. Now this is Yechazkel chapter 10, the continuation of the story. So Hashem tells the angel, says Ish uh, in, in linen, but we associate this with the angel Gabriel. And that's the connection with Daniel also, where it is the angel Gabriel. And he says, come to the, the wheel work. Yechezkel uh, uh, um, describes the throne of God and under it is Kirubim and wheels. And so he says, take some coals from beneath them and throw them onto the city of Jerusalem and burn and destroy the city. And I want you to, and I want you to do that you know, before my eyes. So miyad So one of those kirubim stretches his hands from under and uh, takes some coals that are within those kirubim. El And the keruv give puts it in the hand of Gabriel, and Gabriel takes it and leaves. What's missing? doesn't say that he throws it on Jerusalem. In other words, he's holding the hot coals, right? You know, burning himself, but, uh, with, uh, uh, but not fulfilling the mission or, or delaying the mission. He's holding it for a while till it cools off a little and only later does he throw it because he has so much compassion for B'nai Israel. As as if that if if it had not been that the coals cooled down a little as it went from the hands of the Kirubim to Gabriel who hold held on to it, um, if the full force of God's wrath, in other words, was uh, meted out, then there would not be a remnant of Israel left. It says. Israel's enemies, but it's a euphemism for Israel, um, there would be nothing left at all. So because of Gabriel's uh, uh, heroism, he was able at least to cool it down so some people uh, survived. And Yechezkel, now in chapter 9, um, this Gabriel, 
dressed in this clothing, says, I did what you commanded me to. Um, so, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Beota Sha'a, Hosiu Legabri Yemen, Achore Pargod, Umachiu Shitin Pulse Denura. Amazing. At, when he came and announced, yes, I did it. What, what does it mean he did it? See, he didn't really do it, right? He didn't do it in the right way. He delayed it, he called it off, and then he comes and says, okay, I fulfilled, I fulfilled your mission, as if he did it exactly, right? He's like, uh, he's trying to hide the fact that he didn't do a full mission. So as punishment for Gabriel, he was struck with 60 pulses, literally pulse, um, a Latin word, 60 blows. And was, yeah, he, he, he put himself on the line and he got punished to save B'nai Israel. Amazing. So what's, what's your alibi? If you didn't fulfill the mission, you didn't fulfill the mission, so you deserve punishment. Um, if you say, if you claim that you did fulfill the mission, you didn't fulfill it the right way, right? You delayed and uh, you didn't completely destroy it as Hashem wanted him to. Um, and if you did it, you don't come back and announce, you know, when, you, when someone goes and does something negative, yeah, so you have to do it, yeah. You know, you have to do a, be, a, be a hitman, right? So you come back and you don't give the details. You just say, mission accomplished, right? Yeah. I, did, I did the deed, that's it. You don't come back and make a big announcement of how great it is and all that. He's coming back and giving this big announcement. You see, he's basically he's hiding something. So therefore, he was worthy of punishment. But obviously, we're grateful to Gabriel for, uh, for taking the hit uh, on behalf of Ben Israel. Okay, a uh, uh, beautiful. Achu de Dubiel, Sara de Farsae. Now, you know, every nation has their, uh, their, their angel. So Dubiel is the angel in charge of the Persians. And they, they put him in this place. And he served for 21 days. So in other words, Persia was ascendant for 21 days. So this is going now back to Daniel. Daniel, in a lot of his prophecies, he sees the succession of empires that are going to rule over um, Israel, from the Persians to the Greeks to the Romans, right? And he sees there's going to be a long, he doesn't see the Romans, but the, the, the Greeks, the rabbis interpret it to be the Romans in this fourth stage, but... Uh, okay, however you interpret Daniel. Um, so he sees the, uh, the king of Persia, and he has 21 days. And then Michael, who's our angel, comes, and Michael comes to help out Daniel. And he says, I was there alone with Persia. Daniel's trying to, trying to, to, to fight uh, and get, um, get Israel uh, uh, out of the uh, control of these other nations. Yehabule asin v'chad malche u'farvata de mashig. So why 21 days? That represents 21 kings who are going to rule over Persia and also this place, the seaport of Mashhik, uh, important seaport. Amar, ketibu lid Israel be'akarga. So now Persia, he has this important uh, position. And so he goes and, send, and demands of Daniel, says, I want, uh, I want to pay, I want the Jews to pay extra tax. Uh, so I want you to write that in the contract. That we're ruling over, you have to pay extra tax. Ketabule, he was forced to, what could he do? Okay. Ketabule da banan be'akarga. Not only that, the rabbis have to pay extra tax. Ketabule, he had no choice. So he said, okay, we agree. Gabriel, thankfully, was behind the curtain there in the, in the, in the private room where they're signing. And he jumps out and says, this is unfair. I will not, not stand for this. I'm not going to let you give the, uh, 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 pay extra taxes, make the, the Jews, especially the rabbis, pay extra taxes. Now, where does he get this from? Well, he mentions a pasuk that talks about those who stay up, um, um, those who stay up late. And at uh, the end of the pasuk says, he gives, he gives his beloved sleep. Who is this referring to? He's referring to the wives of Torah scholars. Torah scholars stay up. Uh, late and their wives stay up and uh, attend to them. So the wives get great zechut for uh, supporting 
their husbands in their study of Torah. So for their sake, you can't let this happen, you know, because they're going to pay extra taxes and they're going to be impoverished and it's going to affect their family life. So, and they didn't pay attention to Gabriel. So, like, Gabriel, get out of here. We're, we're signing this document and it's going to force the Jews. They were under the Persians for a long time, you know, 200 years. So Gabriel turns to God and says, take, take all the sages in the whole world and put them on one side of a scale. And Daniel, the beloved one, on the other side, wouldn't he outweigh all the sages? Yes, he would. Gabriel. And so God heard someone pleading on behalf of B'nai Israel. So God says, who is this? Who is this lawyer that, uh, that's pleading on behalf of B'nai Israel and uh, mentioning Daniel? So they, uh, so they said, this is Gabriel, the angel. Let him enter. So this is now back to the beginning, what we started with. You see the Agada very nice. It ends with the way it begins. Gabriel, because he mentions that the zechut of Daniel, that got God's attention. And even though he was very angry, he says, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Who is that, Gabriel? Okay, come in, and uh, you, I'll, I'll allow you to plead on behalf of B'nai Israel. And so he was able to help, uh, help B'nai Israel. Um, okay, how much did he help? Let's see. So uh, he found Dubiel had this uh, contract, the letter that said, right, the Jews agree, we are going to tax them and their rabbis more than everybody else. Um, so then he, now Gabriel is allowed to enter. So he enters, Gabriel wants to grab the contract away and tear it up. So what does Dubiel do? He swallows, he crumples it up, puts it in his mouth, and swallows it, right? Like in a movie. Or others say it was written, but it wasn't signed yet. So he says, stop right there. Don't sign that document. Or the other interpretation is that, yes, it was signed, and he swallowed it. But when he swallowed it, it from the saliva, it erased the, um, the signature, so then it was null and void. And that explains why, why under Persian rule, some people have to pay the extra tax, but some people don't. Um, the Persians were in charge, of course, in the time of the second Bet HaMikdash, but then they were also in charge in Babel later on, when the rabbis of, this is Tamud Bavli, uh, the Sasanian Empire, uh, they were in charge. And so this is probably reflecting the reality then that uh, the Sasanians, the Persians generally were tolerant. And so for in some areas, uh, they lived fine. In other areas, if you had a mean uh, local governor, then they would have to pay extra taxes. And so they're explaining why, yes, there was a contract, but it was half void. And so that, that explains the reality. Um, as uh, Daniel says, as I was departing, I saw the Greek, the prince of Greeks come. He sees that the Greeks are going to take, take charge over the Persians. That's Alexander the Great, the story we saw a few days ago. And, um, and Gabriel screaming and screaming, no, no, don't let the Greeks come. It's bad enough under the Persians. We're just waiting. We thought 21 kings and then the Persians will be done. Then maybe we'll gain independence. And now the Greeks come and now we're under the Greeks. And so, uh, but uh, no one listened to him. And uh, he could not, he could not, he could not uh, undo that. Um, so that's a long, a complex, but very beautiful and deep agada uh, about um, sin and punishment and some of the he heroes of, of Jewish leadership that weren't able to avert totally the punishment, but at least were able to uh, gain some remnant, uh, some alleviation of that suffering. Um, okay, so on the theme of suffering, which the whole agada was about, uh, we go back. We go back to the original uh, question: What's the source for the chisa? Um, uh, some a hint to it, at least in the Torah, or in this case from Nevi'im. So you see, it's not really a source; it's more just a hint or a definition of the word. Where do you see that the chisa is called an affliction? So here's another source. <speaking in Hebrew> Okay, 
Avi. So this is talking about King Shilomo, right? After he becomes king and, you know, the godfather scene. Uh, so uh, the one person that he saves his life is Eviatar HaKohen. Eviatar was with Adonia against Shilomo. So uh, on that, in, that, in, that, in that case, uh, because of that, Shalomo is angry at Eviatad. On the other hand, Eviatad was loyal to David when Avshalom rebelled against David. And so in memory of Eviatad's loyalty for his father, he says, I'm not gonna kill you, but you can't stay around here. You have to go to Anatot. Uh, that's where Yirmiya was from. We learned from here that Anatot seems to be a place for, for a runaway uh, Kohani exile, like Australia, right? Uh, you go there as a, and you stay. Um, because uh, now, because you carried the you carried the Adon before David and hit Anita, you afflicted yourself in all the things that my father was afflicted when he was on the run from his son of Shalom. It was a time of terrible distress. Now, what specifically was the distress of David and his men? The people said, we are hungry. That means they had no food. That means they had no water. They were tired. Doesn't tired mean that they weren't able to wash. And according to that, if tired means washing, then, and that's called in Hit'anna, that's one of the Inuyim. So that's the source. We question the source. Vidil mam and they let sandal. Maybe they, they, their shoes wore, wore out because they were running away for so long and they couldn't get them fixed. And you know, it's talking about not being able to wash. Maybe it's not being able to wear shoes. Ela amar rabbi ishak mehacha. Mayim karim al nefesh ayefa. We're going to connect it further with a different pasuk in Mishle um, that says, like cold water on a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. So here you have the word ayefa. And above we had that they were ayef. And here, what does it mean to be tired? Well, tired, this tiredness is alleviated by cold water on a person's body. Nefesh doesn't generally mean soul, like disembodied platonic soul. It usually means a person's self. Uh, so here we see that washing with water is what alleviates tiredness. So tiredness above means not being able to wash. Okay, so this seems like a good source. Hold on, maybe it's talking about water, cold water that you drink. They're tired and cold water refreshes them. No, doesn't say like cold water in a person, in a body. This is how you prove that nefesh doesn't mean soul. No, it means the body, but rather it says on a body. So therefore it's not talking about drinking, but rather water on the body, which washes. And so by connecting these pistukim together, we have to connect three pisukim together. We could see that washing with water relieves uh, tiredness. Tiredness is one of the things that was experienced by the people of David. And uh, David's people are remembered that they, Eviatar was hit um, anna, that he was afflicted. And therefore, we learned that one of the afflictions is, uh, is washing, not being able to wash. Good. Next item on the list. Une ailat sandal, not wearing shoes. Minelan. Basically, I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have like canvas shoes. So not, not wearing shoes for them meant going barefoot, right? Not just not wearing leather. Um, Back to David, when Avshalom was rebelling, he had to leave uh, Jerusalem and he was going and crying and uh, his head was covered, he was walking barefoot. And, right, we just talked about how David's experience then was called uh, Inui. So there you go, walking barefoot is called Inui as well. So Yachef Mimai, Labne Lat Sandal, what does it mean barefoot? Obviously, no, it wasn't wearing shoes, right? Well, maybe not, Vidilma Mesusia O Marteka. Maybe barefoot means, for David, means without a horse and a whip. He's a king, he's used to riding on a horse, and now he has to walk, even with shoes, I mean, you could still call that yachif um, without his normal uh, way of traveling. So that's not a definite proof. Okay, now we're bringing in Yeshaya. Yeshaya for, has to go barefoot and he has to untie his sackcloth. Basically, he has to go naked. He goes naked and barefoot for, uh, I think, three years. And this is a symbol of uh, a punishment coming on to uh, Mitzrayim. That Mitzrayim are going to go into exile and they're going to have to walk barefoot and naked 
um, because of that. So Yeshay has to actually do it himself. We know the Nevi'im often did acts to, to uh, raise awareness about their message. Now, anyway, and he did this, right? He walked uh, naked and, uh, and uh, barefoot. So we see barefoot is a very uh, unpleasant, this is a punishment, this is an affliction. So doesn't mean that he was, wasn't wearing any shoes at all, and that would be a good source. Maybe not. Maybe he was wearing shoes, but they were uh, broken shoes. They were all patched up. And so it was very uncomfortable shoes. But he was, in fact, wearing shoes. So it's not a definite proof that you can't wear shoes at all. Because he had to do two things. He also had to uh, loosen his sackcloth. What does it mean? Was he going around totally naked? Yeshaya? It doesn't, that doesn't make sense. It means he was uh, just wearing very little clothing, tattered clothing. So it must be that he was wearing um, patched shoes, but not that he was barefoot totally. So we're looking for another source now. Uh, Yermisa says, uh, withhold your foot from being barefoot and your throat from thirst. And yes, mech minachet. You know, don't, don't go barefoot. How could you do that? means don't sin so that then you will get a punishment of having to walk barefoot. So we see here that walking barefoot is a punishment. And don't say, uh, don't say, say idle talk so that your throat will not become thirsty. In other words, you know, don't walk the, down bad ways, otherwise you'll be barefoot, and so on. And so you see here, this is in fact talking about an affliction, a punishment of walking barefoot. And so from here we learn to, uh, to Yom Kippur. Okay, I think it's interesting that we go through this whole exercise. I mean, this is not really halachic sources. They're all from, from, uh, from uh, Nevi'im. But we do see through this, you know, the different afflictions of Nevi'im, of David, and, um, you know, we kind of learn from them and associate with them. So I think it's still interesting in an agadic way, even though it's meshed into a halacha. And finally, Tashmis Hamita Dekre Ainui Menalan. How do you know that a prohibition against the marital relations, that that's called Ainui? Dekhtib, Im Ta'aned Benotaim Tikach Nashim. We saw this pasuk already before. This is when uh, Lavan, uh, Yaakov is leaving Lavan. You know, he runs away and Lavan comes, and finally they have an agreement. And Lavan says, Okay, I want you to swear that you will not afflict my daughters and you will not take other wives besides my daughters, right? Because usually if someone takes other wives, he's not going to attend to his first wives as, uh, as much as often. So now why is this double language? Imta'ane and the imtikah. Imta'ane mitashmish. Imtikah misarot. Imta'ane means if you uh, don't give the regular ona, if, you're, if you don't have marital, marital relations with your current two wives, um, so you promise not to do that. And tikach means, and don't take any other wives besides that. And these are both things that are written in our Ketubah until today. Uh, hold on. How do you know that imta'anne is referring to uh, marital relations? Maybe both are referring to don't take other wives. I'm saying it in two different, don't torture them and don't take other wives. Don't torture them by taking other wives. They say, no, that doesn't read well because mikativ imtikach it's written as two different things. If you didn't have a vav, you could read it, don't afflict my daughters by taking other wives. But the vav says two different things, so therefore it has to be referring to something else. Uh, so therefore one of them is about um, having regular relations with them. Fine, I'll agree with two different things, but maybe it's talking about two different types of co-wives. One is um, the ones that are within your household. Don't take the maidservants and make them wives. And the other is don't take other women that besides them and make them wives. So it still could be two things, but it's talking about taking more wives. So we say, Dumya di im tikach, mi ketiv im tikach, right? Uh, um, and uh, right, this would be part of the question. Similar to imtikach, imtane, imtikach. They're both referring to taken, taking or otherwise, but two different sets of them. We reject that. Miketi imtikach, imtane, imtane, imtikach ketiv. But that would be the wrong order because if it was talking about two different sets of wives, it should have gone from the uh, from the worst 
to the one that's not as bad. And so it should have been the opposite, uh, the opposite way around. Don't take foreign wives. Don't even take the maidservants and make them wives. From the fact that it says it in the opposite way, uh, we reject that reading. Um, okay, good. So we accept it now. This is a good reading. Don't take other wives. That's the imtikach. Imtane means don't withhold regu regular relations with your wives. So therefore we see withhold stopping from marital relations is called ainoi. Uh, question. Right, this is um, regarding Shechem, who goes and takes Dina and uh, rapes her and says so by Anea and afflicts her. So this is an opposite meaning. This is the case where he has relations with her forcibly, and that's called Ainui. That's that's an affliction. Um, so this is, seems to be an opposite uh, understanding. No, that's talking about he forced her in uh, unusual manner, other types of uh, unnatural ways. And so that was the, that was the degradation or affliction of her. Um, but uh, so it actually has two, op it means affliction in two different ways. One could be an uh, unnatural way of forcing someone as in the case of Shechem or, um, or stopping from our relations, relations that are uh, that are that are wanted and are expected. Both of those can mean that. Um, okay, that was. Um, uh, I just gave a. There's another interpretation of this last line that's a little more unkind to Dina, and it says Dina actually wanted more, wanted to be with it with Shechem more, and he said no, no, that's it, just uh, just once. Um, and this portrays Dina as uh, being uh, very promiscuous. There's another midrashic tradition because it's batese dina. What do you mean batese? Oh, she was going out looking for action, uh, kind of you know, blaming her for it. And so the, and according to that, the aina is consistent. It means that Shechem did not have relations at, as much as she wanted uh, with her. Um, but that's, uh, that would follow a, a very different reading of the story. Um, okay, now, Back to uh, back to Washington. Okay, from now to the end of the daf, we're going to talk about exceptions to the rules, um, cases where you are allowed to wash or anoint. So you're not allowed to wash even part of your body. It's not just a full bath. Even 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 one limb is not permitted. But a person actually gets dirty, right? If you fall in the mud, you actually have dirt on you, then you're allowed to wash because you're not washing for enjoyment, but you're just physically unclean. So that's no problem. And same thing with anointing. Any part of the body you can't put oil on, just like the whole body. But if a person is sick um, or he has uh, scabs and uh, he needs... He needs the oil for to, to feel better, then that's fine because he's not doing it for enjoyment, but rather because he needs it for a, as a basic medical necessity. Good. So that's one class of exceptions. Another exception is if uh, someone, uh, a mother is feeding her child, she's allowed to wash a hand. Uh, because this is, I mean, we wash our hands when we eat ourselves. Nowadays, we don't usually wash to feed someone else, but they had diseases back then. It seems this is a certain disease that especially affected children. And so it was a good idea, it was necessary to wash even one hand in order to feed the child so the child will be safe. So uh, this fills, fits into the exception of uh, cleanliness and health. Uh, famous, the original Shammai, he was very machmir, and he didn't want to wash any of his hands, even though he was feeding food to his children. And the rabbis said, no, you have to, not only one hand, but we're going to make you wash two hands, just to show you how important it is. You can't put a child's uh, uh, health in danger just because you want to be machmir. You're not washing because of enjoyment, you're washing so that you'll take off the germs. What is the reason? Shivta is a certain uh, a spirit, evil spirit. Uh, that's what they called it. We could call it germs. It, uh, the effect is the same. Good. This is, I mean, this is relevant today also. You know, sometimes people are, you're, people are preparing food for, the, for their children. So uh, you have to maintain the uh, cleanliness. 
So it's another banana. How do you know that we are pene aviv or pene rabo or pene mishe gadom venu or ven asabaro b'mayim veno choshesh? Another exception is if someone wants to go and visit their father or their rabbi um, or anyone who's greater than them, and they happen to live on the other side of a river, then they can go up until their neck in the river and not worry about it because they're not going in to bathe uh, for enjoyment, but they they're going to get to the other side. And it's a nice mitzvah to go and visit someone. Question, how about the teacher? Can the teacher go to the student's house? Um, because it's mitzvah to also to teach. Um, even though it's not out of respect, is that good enough? So Rabbi Yisrael says, yes, I saw one time Zaidi, he went through a river to visit Rabbi Rav Chia, his student, so therefore must be allowed. But this story is not reliable. So you got the characters mixed up. It was the student who went to the teacher. So good story, but opposite lesson. Oh well. Okay, not only for a great thing like to go study Torah or to visit your father, but Rava would even allow the, the people uh, on the other side of the Euphrates to pass through to guard their fruit on Yom Kippur. Um, I guess they had a break, right? They weren't in the uh, kinis all day, um, but uh, they don't want uh, birds and animals to come and get the fruit. So you, I mean, you're, not, you're not allowed to do any agricultural work, but just to stand there and so uh, to guard your fruit is, is permitted. And he even permitted them to walk through water to do that. Um, according to that, I guess it would be obvious that a teacher can go to a student. Tanya Mesaya de Mesaya Lach. Abaye helped out his colleague Rava and says, what you said is true. And in fact, there's a Braita that supports it. Because it says, Shomre Perot, Obrina Sabaran, Bamayim Ven Choshishin. Want to go watch your fruit? You can even go up to your neck in the water to, uh, to, to, to be there. Rav Yosef Shalal Hulibne Be Tarbu, Rabban Be Mayal Mete, Le Firka. Okay, back to studying Torah. The Pirka was a big public lecture that uh, a sage would, would give, and uh, he expected everyone to be there. It was you know People would come by, uh, the, all the masses would come, including the rabbi's students. If you didn't show up to it, then the, rabbis would get, the rabbi would get very insulted, and uh, this would cause a lot of tension. So anyway, uh, uh, for that reason, Rav Yosef said, you're, the students are allowed to pass through water, even on Yom Kippur, in order to attend the lecture, you know, the, the, the Yom Kippur de Rasha. Um, but to come back, he did not permit them. You can go there because you're going to study Torah. Come back home. What do you need to come back home for? Stay there till after Kippur and drive home. That's not a good idea because they're not going to want to go. If you don't let them come back home, they're not going to want to go in the first place. This is a halakha that's relevant today, like going to the hospital. It's okay, you're allowed to go to the hospital, but you can't come back home. A lot of people, they're not going to go, right? Especially ambulance drivers, tatsala workers. Uh, then if, you, if they can't come home, they're not going to want to go. So therefore, uh, I think most poskim say, you're allowed to go and you're allowed to come back. Good. Another version of what we just said, um, basically the same thing. Some say that the original of Yosef said, you can go, and yes, you can come back through the water, even in Yom Kippur, because it's all part of the journey. Rather than supporting, he actually, he was the one that questioned it and said, I understand going for a mitzvah, but what do you have to come back for? And the answer was, so that the next year, they'll, they'll, they won't remember. They'll say, oh, we got stuck there. The whole keyboard it was terrible. And they're not going to want to go in the first place. Um, so the conclusion is the same. All right. Rav Yehuda and Rav Shemuel bar Rav Yehuda. The names in this uh, in the following story are a little confusing. You have Rav Yehuda and his son, Rav Shemuel. Um, they were standing at the bank of a river called the Papa River. Um, and uh, next to the Hasdad crossing. There was someone named Rami Bar Papa standing on the other side of what happened to be called the Papa River. All right, maybe the river was called that because he lived there. I don't know. Mehakisa. Rema Lehu Kala is another play on words. His name was Rami. And he, uh, he, he, he raised his voice, which is the word Rama. So he's calling 
this Rami is calling to the other side of the river, calling to Rav Yehuda and Rav Yehuda's son to ask them a question. To ask them a question. Am I allowed to cross over the river so I can come to ask you a question? Which is curious because he actually is asking a question right now by asking a question, am I allowed to cross over to ask a question? Okay, and this is a short question. He has a more elaborate question. He's to ask them in person and not screaming. So is he allowed to do that? So they yelled back across the river and said, Am I Yehuda? Rav Ushmoel, it happens to be his son's name is Rav Shmuel. He's not quoting his son, he's quoting the Amoraim, Rav and Shmuel. He says, my teachers, Rav Yudas teachers are both Rav and Shmuel. They said, yes, you're allowed to go to study Torah um, as long as when you're passing through the river, you don't pick your, your cloak up on top of your shoulders, right? Maybe you don't want it to, to, to get wet. Um, and so they, you kind of fold up the bottom of the cloak and put it over your shoulders. That you're not allowed to do, probably because that would be carrying. That's not the normal way to wear it. So you got to just keep it down, keep it regular, and walk through. Then it's a, then it's allowed. Ika de Amre, or another version of the story. Shemuel It wasn't Rav Yudah that answered, but rather it was his son, Rav Shemuel the son of Rav Yudah, who answered the question. And he answered not by quoting Rav and Shemuel, but rather by quoting a Braita that says the same thing. You can cross as long as you don't remove your hand from the hem of your cloak. You keep the hem down and you don't pick it up. Okay, good. So that answers all the questions that you're allowed to walk through water if it's for a good purpose. And now we're gonna end with a complete side question. Hold on, walking through a river up to your neck? Isn't that dangerous? Even all year round, forget Yom Kippur. It seems like not a good idea to do that. Matkif Larav Yosef, Bachol, Kihai Kavna Mishare. And a weekday, are you allowed to walk into a river up to your neck? Aren't you afraid of drowning? Okay, we're gonna go through a long proof here that walking in deep water is not permitted, not a good idea. We're learning this from Yechezkel. Uh, we, we saw this a while ago. Yechezkel chapter 47 is, has a vision for the future, uh, end of days. And he says, and those days, water, he's describing the third Bet HaMikdash. And he says, there's going to be a source of water from inside the Kodesh Kodashim that's going to come out. It's going to be a tiny little stream. It's going to grow bigger and bigger as it leaves Jerusalem and goes to the rest of the world, symbolizing, you know, Torah that will be uh, um, come from Jerusalem and spread and inspire the whole world. So he, so yeah, Hashem is telling Yechezkel, I want you to go and measure this, uh, the, this water and uh, see how, how it works. So he goes a thousand amot uh, from the Kodesh Kodeshim, and he sees that the water is only ankle deep, very low. And Yechezkel is passing through them. So obviously you're allowed to pass through water that's very low up to the ankles. But then Yechezkel continues to walk. And he measures another thousand amot uh, and at this point, the water grows up to his and, uh, uh, knees. And he's still passing through them, so obviously you're allowed to walk up to your knees. And then it goes up to his waist, and he's still walking through it. And after that, it says, the water got so high that I was not able to pass it. So why wasn't able to pass it? Maybe it went up to his neck. But you see here that you're not allowed to pass through water that goes up to one's neck. So that's the question. How come the rabbis and all the stories before uh, were passing through water up to the neck? Weren't they afraid of drowning and it was, it was dangerous? This is no, uh, a, a river is, is different because it's flowing fast and then you could drown. But these rabbis were just going through a lake or still water. And so therefore, yes, you can go up to the neck as long as it's still water. If it's running water, then yeah, you're afraid you might lose your balance and that would in fact be very dangerous. Okay, we're gonna go back to this uh, Yechezkel uh, 47 and just say a little bit and a little bit more about it. Um, okay, uh, this, uh, I, I can, can you traverse in Yechezkel? Was he able to traverse it by swimming? Right? I know it was very high, but maybe he could swim. Well, the Pasuk says, Ki ga'u me sahu. The water got so high, 
from swimming. Um, the Peshat is probably means that it was so high you could only swim in it, but it could also be interpreted it was so high you couldn't even swim in it, right? Too high even to swim. So my me sahu, what does this mean? What does this word mean from swimming? Uh, the word sahu itself, we're not sure what it means. Shiuta, right? Doesn't it mean swimming? Sheken korin the shayata secha. Sorry, siuta means uh, sailing, right? In a boat. Because sometimes le shayet, it could mean swimming, but it could also mean going in a boat. And so this is, means it was so high, you couldn't even swim, you need a boat. What kind of boat? Could it be a small boat? Uh, something like, no, we don't have a picture of a small boat. Um, uh, could it be like a small rowboat? And I said, no, uh, because now, now we're going to Yeshaya. Yeshaya also is, uh, has a vision of the end of days and has to do with water. So we're combining Yeshaya's description with Yechezkel's description. And he says over there, Baal tedech bo oni shayit. You, the water is too rough, too high. You can't even go in it with a rowboat. How about a big boat like this one? It's called the Burni. No, not even a big boat uh, can go in. A fishing boat, right? Uh, there you go, it's for you, Abi. You can't even go in that. My mashma, get me to give up yourself. That is the baby's finat sayadin, uburni rabati, lo te gozi na. And that of a self translated as a fishing boat that will not travel on it and the large ship will not cross it. So the point is that um, this small stream is going to grow so big that you can't even swim over it, you can't even go on a boat over it. Amazing. Because this river is so great, even the angel of death will not be able to pass it, which means in this uh, vision of the future, the angel of death can't get there, can't get to people. So uh, people will, will, will uh, be immortal and no longer be subject to uh, this angel. We're connecting the pasuk that we just mentioned, that even a boat can't travel through, and the word shayit. In the Yov, right, the beginning of the Yov, Hashem tells the uh, Satan, where were you? He says, I was shoot, I was going back and forth in the land. So you see that angels uh, walk with shoot, and if this is this river is so great that you can't even shoot in it, you can't even uh, pass through it. So in those in those in those days, this will be a block that the angel of death will not be able to pass through. Okay, a little more to uh, finish this topic. So this this uh, mayan the spring that in the future will come up from the Kodesh Kodashim, it starts off in the beginning very thin, like a grasshopper's antenna, very small stream. And then when it gets, once it gets to the Hechal, outside the Kodesh Kodashim, it becomes like a thread of, um, of a, uh, a warp. And when it comes out of that, it becomes thicker like the woof, right? the two th directions of weaving, uh, the woof was apparently a little bit thicker than the warp. When it goes out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the courtyard, it's already a small jug. Uh, as much as that would pour. And this uh, make, uh, fits with another statement of Rabbi Eliezer that in the future, um, there will bubble from, uh, from under the threshold of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. There's already going to be noticeable water. And when it gets to the entrance of uh, the city of David, 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 the palace of David, of David, and by that time, it's not very far out, it's already a flowing river. And so, since Pasuk now in Zechariah, we really we covered uh, all the books of Tanakh today. Um, uh, there will be a fountain open for the house of David for the purification and for sprinkling for of chatat uh, and nida. So in other words, it's going to be uh, high enough that even the nida can go into it. 
אמר רב יוסף, מכאן רמז, אני יודע שסליחה להשב עד צו הרעה במים. או, oh, we can learn from this ההלכה, או הינטו ההלכה, because it's from זכריה, not from the Torah, that a מקווה has to be deep enough that it goes up to one's neck. That was, should, a mikveh shouldn't be uh, 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 very shallow that a person has to lie down because it's hard to use. It should go up to the neck. But that halacha is not like that. Um, but it, actually, this is, uh, this is uh, discussed in poskim uh, regarding uh, the shape of a mikveh, how high it has to be. And lechat does have to be doesn't have to go up to the neck, but it has to be high enough like waist so that it's comfortable to, uh, to, to go down. Uh, into the mikveh. Uh, one last halacha about this. Actually, you're not allowed to uh, go to the mikveh in a flowing river if it's rainwater, because that's to be mikveh, it has to be collected water. Uh, however, if it's a ma'ayan, if it comes from under the earth, a- 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 aquifer water, then uh, it is permitted to go into it even, even, even though it's uh, flowing. So you see here, this is in fact aquifer water. So uh, amazing, agada, uh, also relevant halacha. Baruch Adonai Amen, amen.